Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by River, the place that I personally go to securely invest in Bitcoin with confidence and with zero fees. Bitcoin now is more competitive with real estate because you now have different cash flow strategies using covered calls and et cetera, but you don't have to deal with the underlying headache of real estate. That's just one of like many different options that this unlocks. It's like a 10x in terms of inbound liquidity for Bitcoin. So, I mean, to me, it's like wildly bullish. Lots to talk about here. Last week, uh, let's just kick it off into high gear because last week I'm looking at two massive, massive announcements. The first one being the custody that the SEC is giving to BNY Mellon. And then the other one is now uh, we can do derivatives on top of IBIT. Is it just IBIT or is it all the ETFs that they're allowing this? Uh, do you guys know? Yeah, for now it's IBIT. But it'll be all IBIT. of them eventually. Okay. You know, I'm reminded of this clip that, I don't know, it was like a year, a year and a half old with Sailor. He was on in some spaces and he said, you know, there's three things that are going to take Bitcoin to multi-million dollar price point. Uh, in USD terms. And those three things, the first one was the change in the gap accounting treatment, which happened, I don't know, about a year ago. The approval of an ETF, which happened about a, you know, nine months ago. And then banks being able to custody Bitcoin. So last week, and he's not even talking the derivative options being traded on top of it, but with the custody now being approved for BNY, it seems like they're doing like some type of test run the SEC gave them some type of approval. What are your thoughts? Is this a big deal? Are we making a big deal out of this? Uh, let's just go around the horn. Uh, anybody want to start on the, yeah, on the scene? Go for it. Sure. Well, so is it a big deal? For sure, right? This is all inevitable. We all knew this was coming. Everything that's happening and that's going to happen continues to be inevitable. Uh, we're watching Wall Street embrace Bitcoin fully. We're watching the SEC start to embrace it. We're watching the regulatory framework get built up around it. The financial rules get built up around it. It chaps the hides of lots of true Bitcoiners, right? They're, they're very concerned about, is it stealing the soul of Bitcoin to have Wall Street so involved? And can they do something uh, deleterious to the network because of this? That remains to be seen, right? Um, but to me, this is all just as expected. It's kind of exciting. Like if you're into price going up, number go up, and I'm sure we'll get talking about, you know, our, our bullish sentiment uh, a little later in the show. This is all very encouraging. This is going to increase the volume. It's going to increase the interest for Wall Streeters to get on board. Having options available to trade is a super important next step. It basically means that Bitcoin has moved up a level in the maturity scale and the seriousness of it as an asset. So I think it's all really natural. I think there's going to be snafus along the way. I think there's going to be people who can abuse it, right? There's always bad apples that might do bad things uh, with this. They might manipulate the price that everybody always talks about, price manipulation. But in general, it's good because it adds a ton of volume in general. And when you have a lot of volume, the big institutional investors like that. They don't want to come in with a billion dollar buy order and, and just jack the price up $20,000 uh, because they want to buy or they want to sell. Um, when you have these much larger pools of liquidity, this much higher volume, that means institutional investors and endowments and other big hedge funds and things will be much more interested in Bitcoin as an asset. So I think it's a net good in general for Bitcoin. Bottle. The way I look at the options announcement recently, and by the way, I was, I was thinking about the same spaces that you had referenced with Sailor. And I think if he had had a little more, you know, just slightly more prescience there, not that he didn't already have a ton, obviously he nailed it, but like, um, he probably would have put the options, you know, treatment as the fourth thing. Right. Yeah. And for me, the, this options market is just this big amplifier for the Bitcoin price. I mean, it's it's like this massive capital unlock for the smart money. I mean, there's so many different things we could talk about with it. And like, I don't fully understand a lot of it. So I'd love to get like Joe's take on it because I think he understands the plumbing of the options markets a lot better than I do. But, you know, just, I mean, something that comes to the top of my head is that, you know, Bitcoin now is more competitive with real estate because you now have different cash flow strategies using covered calls and et cetera, but you don't have to deal with the underlying headache of real estate. That's just one of like many different options that this unlocks. And I think it's just going to be a massive, yeah, it's a massive amplifier. And it's, it's like a 10x in terms of inbound liquidity for Bitcoin. So, I mean, to me, it's like 
wildly bullish. And I, I don't know, you know, we've ever seen an options market like the one we're going to see on Bitcoin. I think it's going to be wild, both directions, you know, upside and downside. I will say this, Hoddle. So I was interviewing Sailor in Madeira. This is, I think, February of 2024. And on stage, he was saying that within, I, th I think he was saying like within nine months to a year that derivatives were going to get approved on top of the ETFs. And it was going to be a massive, massive big deal because of the amount of liquidity, the amount of volume, the amount of like reinforcement of all the legacy dollars and legacy fiat system, basically plugging itself in, not just. Uh, the ETF was like plugging it in. And then like all of this was like plugging 40 other cables into this thing in order to just kind of like add a whole new layer of access to Bitcoin. You need to go back and listen to his real comment, not my, my Jerry rigged, uh, interpretation of it. But that's what, what I remember him distinctly saying back yeah. then. I want to say it was like February of this year, but Joe, go ahead, take it away. Yeah. Options for those that are unfamiliar that may not be as savvy in terms of the old school derivative type systems that we have in the legacy markets, they provide contract exposure, right? There's a reason you call it an options contract is derivative exposure where you can either establish long exposure or you can protect yourself against downside exposure by put options. These are extremely attractive to institutional investors because they let them calculate a defined risk benefit reward, right? Rather than just going long only exposure, rather than just buying the spot exposure, what they can do with an options contract is they can do a variety of different things. They can do uh, cross asset exposures, right? Long equity, short Bitcoin, short Bitcoin, long equities, fetch the books however they want. And it provides much more flexibility that you'd want if you're trying to build out, you know, cross asset allocations. So from the standpoint of Bitcoin, it's extraordinarily interesting, right? Because you have the first finite asset that we have and you have the introduction of the ETFs. And Dr. Jeff is exactly right. What you're effectively doing is you're pouring in leverage into the space. You're letting it be attractive to a lot of institutional investors who would not feel comfortable just having naked long exposure into Bitcoin, who would not just want to buy the spot, right? They want to have the hedge. Even if they want to just get a long exposure, they can't risk the downside of a 20% negative move in Bitcoin. They can hedge that with a spot position. And the interesting thing about that is, and this is the real story, I think, if you are buying options, say there's overwhelming demand in the options market for calls or for longs, in any way in the market, what has to happen is the market makers then have to effectually uh, position against the imbalance, right? So if there's a long exposure, they have to be positioned short to correct the imbalance. Same is true, right? If there's a ton of call selling, right? And I hear people really eager and salivating at the idea to sell call against their spot IBID position, right? The dealers actually have to bid that. It's interesting, right? Like they actually have to go into the supply, buy the IBID share, which then in turn buys the Bitcoin. So you have this reflexive loop. All of it, in many ways, tampers down volatility when there is a balance in the market. So you might not see as painful of the drawdowns. You might see somewhat more capped upside. But what that effectively does is it provides a more institutionally safe investment, right? Where like in 2017 market where you had just the spot exposure, you want to buy Bitcoin, sure, there was GBTC, but a lot of people would just buy the spot exposure, right? There wasn't an easy way until really the CME futures launched to get derivative exposure and to hedge. So you see these rapid swings up to like 19.6 at the end of the year. Now you're going to have a lot of institutions that can play that and that can tampen down the volatility and it makes it more attractive. Um, now, some people may say, oh, well, that means you're not going to have these blow off tops. I strongly disagree with that because there are plenty of options markets where, you know, for example, GME, right? Where there was massive market demand, you saw that thing just get bid and go to the moon, right? Options do not necessarily mean that you can't have an absolute run in the market. What we've seen in the SPY, for example, and QQs, if you look at their zero data expiration options contracts, those have actually moved the market significantly. There's many days where the, the zero DTEs are moving the market more than actually spot bidding. So it, it is like pouring gasoline on a fire. I think it's really exciting. And I think it's exactly what institutions want to get at least excited in the, the spot exposure. How long until you can do this on some of the other products, not just iBit, you think, Joe? Well, my guess is they will all launch together. Um, there's a couple different layers they have to go through just because the SEC approved it. You also have to get some CFTC approval. So uh, we're still a little confused as to when they're actually going to launch. Eric Balchinas, I think, was speculating. He's the Bloomberg analyst. That was going to be a couple of months. My source tells me it could be a little bit quicker than that. Six months, we could see, or six weeks, two months, we could see them launch. And I would, I would place a heavy, hefty wager that many of the spot ETFs will launch with options on the same day. Wow. 
And if I can jump in, one of the things that's exciting as a fund manager myself, I, you know, I run a small fund. I've been waiting for this because what this does then is it opens up the possibility within my fund, which is based at interactive brokers. So in a standard brokerage account, if we do get another peak, if we have this exponential move higher into 2025 and say Bitcoin goes to 200 or 400 or 600,000 or whatever it goes to, instead of having to sell everything and take that massive tax hit, what I can do is go out and buy puts as Joe was talking about, right? And I can hedge my exposure to the downside without having to sell and hold on to the assets that I have. So the, and a lot of institutional investors are going to do that same sort of thing. If you don't have to take that big tax hit at the end of a bull cycle, that's pretty exciting. So, Just one thing to round out this conversation. Some people might hear this and they make it all excited about selling call options against their Bitcoin and getting all uh, levered up with those. But there are many call option type ETFs that are in the market. I know Dr. Jeff knows some of these. They will actually try to generate income and they'll make money from the call option sales, right? The reality is, Many of these products have underperformed just by and holding the equity ETFs, right? So if you're doing that, it's kind of a way to get Bitcoin exposure, but you're capping your upside to some degree. When Bitcoin goes on these absolute tears, sure, you get your premium from selling, you know, high implied volatility contracts at, you know, 10% out of money. You'll capture that premium, right? But then you get Bitcoin going on a tear, you're going to miss out on that upside and you're going to actually underperform. So Anybody thinking about doing this, just be careful. You could potentially miss out on some of the most epic Bitcoin runs that we could see coming. How do we communicate the importance of still buying your own coins and taking self-custody? Because I think in the coming four years, especially eight years, the way that a majority of people are participating in the markets are going to be through these ETF vehicles. What's hey, your point of view? What you, explain your point of view on this. That is a really hard predicament on that question you just asked, because I mean, it's two totally different types of, of, of Bitcoiners, right? So you got the guys who bought Bitcoin when it was uh, $5 and they've been holding onto it for dear life and securing it against cyber threats and, you know, using their cold card and their multi-sigs and their geographically distributed this and that, and, you know, practicing OPSEC and yada, yada. Then on the, on the polar opposite end of the bell curve, you got the guy who got rich off the fiat system, who's yeah, got a hundred million dollars with Goldman and he can just call them up and be like, yo, I'm already trusting you with $100 million in this relationship. Pick up some Bitcoin for me. You know what I mean? And he, that guy is not going to be interested in taking custody of his own keys because there's a slew of problems that come with it. I mean, there was just a social engineering attack for $250 million, some, like 4,000 Bitcoin. These kids who were in LA and Miami got this guy who was a Genesis creditor. It was a single person, a single Bitcoin whale to give up 4,000 Bitcoin just via a social engineering scheme where they called him up and pretended to be Google and Coinbase and, and Kraken and whatever they pretended to be. We'll learn the details later through the FBI. But a lot of people look at that, especially people with real money, and they go, Jesus Christ, that's a, that's a headache. I told press I wouldn't swear on the show. That's a, that's, a, that's a headache, you know? And I don't want to deal with that headache. And so because I don't want to deal with that headache, I'm just going to continue path of least resistance. I'm going to continue trusting my broker who I already know and like and who I believe has my best interests at heart. And that's the path I'm going to take. So it's just, two ends of the bell curve. I think Bitcoin's going to sort of bifurcate in that sense that like the Bitcoiners that have their keys, like myself, are never going to get rid of them. And the Bitcoiners that, you know, are just now entering the market are probably never going to take custody of their coins. I'll just throw that in there just to piggyback on what you said, Hal. This is like a first world problem, right? I mean, Americans, we're into Bitcoin for the profit. Wall Street's going to come in because they want to make a lot of money, right? They see this asset that has this historically high returns, incredible sharp ratio, risk-adjusted returns. They want a piece of this action and they're going to get into it for the first time this cycle. And that's what's going to really help propel the price higher. You start talking to people like Alex Gladstein and people who are in other countries and in developing nations, they're not in here to make a million dollars on a quick hit, right? They're not going to be selling uh, options, trading options. They're not going to be buying calls on Bitcoin. They're using it as life support to get away from their government fiat currency and to, to maintain their purchasing power. So this is like a completely just foreign discussion to people like that. And so that's to your point, Hala, like, why are you in Bitcoin? There's so many different reasons why people are in Bitcoin and it can vary by geography. It varies by your income status, all these different things, your experience. But what I love about Bitcoin, though, is all of this nonsense that's just going to happen because of Wall Street getting on board and driving the fiat price higher. It's going to help people all around the world who are, you know, sitting in Africa right now and they only have just a couple sats to their names and they're just barely trying to make it. And this is going to help increase the value of the entire network and it will benefit those people as well. So that's a good thing. Yeah. I'll just tell you, I think we're not thinking big enough with respect to these ETFs. 
My particular view is by the end of the decade, you will see a seamless integration between Bitcoin and most financial services, including brokerage accounts. Sure. I think you'll be able to deposit Bitcoin in your brokerage account. Or you'll be able to buy any security with it. And I think the ETFs will be a revolving door where you can court some of your wealth to the ETF if you want. You'll be able to withdraw in kind from Bitcoin spot ETFs. There's no technological reason why that can't exist. It's a regulatory bureaucracy, legal headache, which those are the easiest ones to fix. The tech is easy, right? If you've got, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars in an ETF and that becomes a million and you want to port some two hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin out of there, I think that they're going to open those up at some point by the end of the decade. And it's not going to be as, uh, you know, uh, bilateral as we think that, oh, you either have to have all your keys or all of your, you know, Bitcoin in, uh, in the custody provider. I think you're going to be able to move back and forth, seamlessly integrating between it. I think every bank's going to be able to custody it. I just think we're just early days and it's going to take, you know, six, eight more years. So Joe, I, I have heard from people like sources inside BlackRock that they're expecting uh, in-kind treatment within the next two years. So not even six days. Well, well, that's, that's different. So you've got two different things, right? And this is really, there's a ton of confusion on this. What you're talking about is correct. The, the in-kind contribution, but those are from authorized participants. So right mm -hmm. now, the way the trust requires the IBIT or other trusts require the Bitcoin, they go through the authorized participants. And right now it's through cash creates, right? That cash create system is what the SEC was insistent on. They did not want people to be able to port uh, their Bitcoin from the authorized participants into the ETF structures. Some people say that was just a, you know, proverbial screw you to uh, GBTC. We'll leave that aside, but we're, however it shook out, it shook out now where there's cash creates for the shares. That is expected to change within the near term. What I'm talking about is a little different. I'm talking about Dr. Jeff Ross has X amount of shares of IBIT, and he wants to convert 40% of those shares into spot Bitcoin. There is no technological reason why those shares could not convert and move into spot Bitcoin with a withdrawal minus the fees or whatever processing transaction you need to have. So you could have something you can't do with GLD, right? Unless you are significant with size in the gold ETF, the GLD, the main gold ETF, you cannot withdraw and take the gold, okay? For obvious reasons, right? It's really hard and difficult to transport the gold. There's no reason that can't happen with Bitcoin and Bitcoin spot ETFs. Yeah. The Bitcoiner in me is very conspiratorial when I hear you say that because I think, well, why the hell would they want to let people take Bitcoin out of the what is effectively a government honeypot? I mean, come on, let's be real. BlackRock is like a financial, like, you know, operatives for the U.S. government. I mean, they're juiced in, right? Like, you know, the, the Winklevoss twins do an ETF and they wait in the in the line for 10 years being like, please, sir, fill my soup bowl with just whatever you can spare. And then BlackRock files and six months later, there's ETFs galore, right? Like, so to me, I think that, you know, if the government is smart here, they're going to want to trap as much Bitcoin as they possibly can. And, you know, they would they would stop that sort of revolving door, like you put it. Although that said, if you want to get as many Bitcoin as you possibly can into these ETF products, you would allow Bitcoiners to put their Bitcoin in uh, and be able to margin against their Bitcoin, because that's very tantalizing to be able to do because you don't have to sell your Bitcoin and you can start using it to purchase things that you want. So I don't know. We'll see how it all shakes out. Yeah, the only thing I'll say is that market factors could influence BlackRock's decision on other markets. You know, if they're losing market share, if you get some smaller players to launch an ETF that allows you to withdraw in kind in Bitcoin, if that teamed the market, right, I would doubt more money would flow to the bigger players. I think at least you'd capture a significant market share from the smaller players. And we see this, right? There's a reason why all of the brokerage houses drop fees. You know, Robinhood started it as an upstart, right? And then everybody followed suit. They all dropped fees. You know, you would make the same argument. Well, why why should Schwab and Fidelity and uh, these bigger players, why should they have fees on transactions? Well, because the upstarts come and the upstarts start to cannibalize their efforts. And this is why, like, even GBTC, right? GBTC had to launch the mini Bitcoin, the BT, symbol BTC, because they couldn't compete with fees with BlackRock and the other providers. So I think it happens naturally as new participants come to the market and they say, hey, we want a portion of the, the Bitcoin spot market and we're going to be better. We're going to be you know, we're going to give on-chain addresses for all of our Bitcoin. We're going to allow withdrawals. It seems right for takeover if you actually bring a product to market that is better. Joe, I've got a question for you. Just today, I read BlackRock amends their custody agreement with Coinbase, filed it with the SEC. As detailed in the SEC filing, the amendment updates the Section 2.1 of the Custodial Service Agreement. Coinbase custody mount now must process withdrawals of digital assets to a public blockchain address within 12 hours of receiving instructions from the trust or its authorized representatives. Mm -hmm. 
what's happening here? Why, why are they updating this to 12 hours? It used to be 24 or 48. It used 24. Yeah. 24. I, I think it's just for the sake of efficiency, they wanted to move quicker. I mean, it's a good thing. It's positive, right? We want yeah. uh, settlement real in, at a faster basis. And I don't view it as anything nefarious or negative. I just think it's more of a faster way of updating the instructions where they're giving the addresses to the institutions or authorized participants, and they're trying to fulfill balance requirements. Is this yeah. because they're getting a little bit of slippage or just? I haven't heard that at all. Um, all I know is that, first of all, we hear all the time about these rumors that I categorically reject that BlackRock or other ETFs do not have the Bitcoin. I think that is preposterous. Putting it aside, my view is that they're just trying to be more efficient and they're trying to get hold of the Bitcoin on a faster basis, which is a good thing, right? Any other thoughts on this one? Yeah, when I, when I read it, I just viewed it as BlackRock dictating terms to Coinbase for, like Joe said, for greater market efficiency. Like they were like, all right, listen, like speed it up. Like 24 is too slow. We're BlackRock. We say 12, it's 12. <laughs> and like, that's, that's, that was the takeaway I had from it. Yeah. What do you guys think about now that BNY Mellon is going to start doing custody services? Do you see them starting to eat into some of the Coinbase custody? You would think that 10 years from now, we're not going to live in a world where Coinbase has control of as many coins as they currently do as a custodian. I mean, right now there, that, that is a risk, like the, the centralization of coins at a single custodian. I mean, cause I think Fidelity is the only, uh, ETF provider that's not custodying coins with Coinbase. And then iBit and Grayscale and a few others are some of the smaller players are so that it's a real central point of failure there. Now, like, I'm sure that the keys are in multi-sig, et cetera, but still, the, you know, there's some process at Coinbase that is the central point of failure. Um, so, yeah, I, I would think that just as a differentiate, differentiation point in the markets that you'll want to have different, like for me personally, I, you know, in my retirement account, I bought uh, Fidelity instead of iBit because I like the fact that Fidelity is doing their own custody, right? Uh, I also don't like BlackRock because of ESG and a bunch of other reasons, but it's, you know what I mean? I, that was, that was calming to me as an investor. And I know people who did, you know, half and half, they were like, I'll buy half iBit and I'll buy half Fidelity because of the custodial risk. And so I think we're going to see more of that Bitcoin, you know, separate. And yeah, why wouldn't it go to sophisticated players like BNY Mellon or JP Morgan Chase or whomever, right? Gets involved. Isn't it interesting that a lot of the ESG stuff is uh, really starting to spin the other way? Like I just read this week, and it seems that AI is really kind of driving the the trend reversal where everybody's like, all right, well, we need lots of energy. So now all of a sudden we're all about nuclear, <laughs> right? Oh, totally. Because the Microsoft, I guess, is firing up Three Mile Island again or whatever. I mean, it's it's pretty fascinating to see it all taking place right now. And, it, and great for Bitcoin that, uh, you know, I guess everybody looks at AI and they're saying there's a use case. There's no use case with Bitcoin mining. So uh, they weren't on board until until AI came along. But uh, I think this is really a good development for Bitcoin to continue to scale and for more energy to come online. Um, oh, ab just, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because yeah. basically what they've figured, what big tech has figured out is that uh, if you have an LLM model and you can throw the most amount of power at it, you win. Which, mm -hmm. which does that sound like as Bitcoiners? It sounds very similar to the way Bitcoin mining works. I mean, there's no direct output there, but they're all fighting for, you know, they, they believe it's going to be a winner take most or a winner take all market which is probably correct. And so, you know, I think it's great that they're subsidizing nuclear power and they're using their political connections to get it done because we were not able to get it done at all. I mean, we've been, we've been on this beat for 10 years and nobody cared about us. We were, we were just like the weirdos in the corner. But yeah. uh, when Bill Gates is like, we need to build power plants, suddenly, you know, it starts happening, which, which is fantastic. I also think like, you know, ESG sort of went away as like a, it was a zero interest rate policy phenomenon. Like the minute ZERP ends and all of a sudden like, we can't be mandating, uh, you know, political ideology to companies for whatever reason. Okay. Anything else on the ESG part before we move on guys? All I'll say with that is the, to me, it's very clear that the Overton window is shifting, right? Yeah. I think it's gone about as far left as it could go of all the socially acceptable topics like ESG, like we, I don't want to get into all that right now, but I think we're starting to shift back towards the center again. And to Hoddle's point and to your point, Preston, we just realized, look, we, these, these unreliable renewable energy sources, they just don't work. They're, they're super crappy. Brownouts are terrible to live through. We actually need legitimate baseload energy. 
and nuclear is awesome, you know? And so that's, it's starting to shift and now it's socially acceptable uh, for people on the left to talk about that and to say those things. So I can't believe it took this long because uh, it's been really annoying, uh, but I'm really excited to see uh, that we're finally moving back to the center for these topics. So that's all I have to say. So uh, I want to talk about this uh, SAB 121. SAB stands for Staff Accounting Bulletin 121. I'm, I'm assuming, Joe, you're really well versed on this. Um, effectively, just to kind of simplify this for, for folks. So if banks are going to custody and obviously BNY Mellon, I don't think falls in, in under this with this uh, announcement this past week, but banks, if they're going to custody Bitcoin or any type of digital asset, they have to treat it as a liability on their balance sheet. And then they have to have cash reserves or some type of asset to offset this liability that they would be holding on behalf. So it, let's say they have $100 million of Bitcoin that they're custodying. They then have to have a certain amount of assets in excess of that $100 million that they would be custodying to offset that, that quote unquote risk on their balance sheet. So SAB 121 is trying to, there's a lot of banks, uh, a lot of bankers that are trying to get this overruled so that the treatment isn't that it's held as a, as a liability on their balance sheet. Interestingly, Basel three came out, I want to say near the beginning of this year, and it specifically broke out two different groups. You had group one, you had group two, and basically they're saying that, uh, crypto assets need to have a 1,250% risk weighting. So in the example I used earlier, if you're squatting on a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin, you basically have to have 1.25 billion of assets on your balance sheet to uh, offset the custody of that hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin. So this makes it impossible for banks to want to touch it. There's been a lot of uh, uh, Howard Lutnick, uh, who is uh, from Cantor Fitzgerald has come out. He talked a, a lot about this openly uh, in, in a couple different interviews saying, there's no way we can get banks to ever touch this for all these reasons that I just described. Uh, Joe, I'm curious, first of all, did I get that right? <laughs> My description. Well, that I'll say it's connected to the story we just talked about, the B uh, uh, BNY Mellon, okay? Because they actually got the exemption yeah. from SAB 121, okay? So just for your viewers and listeners, uh, the, the backstory starts with the, the SEC uh, basically puts forward this bulletin, okay? Staff counting bulletin, 121. And this imposes these restrictions on custody uh, arrangements for various institutions, okay? And then at that point, there was widespread sort of uh, animosity towards this, so much so that they actually got a bipartisan bill passed by some Democrats through the Congress, set it to Biden's desk, and lo and behold, it gets vetoed. Okay, disappointment, right? Uh, the then you get this exemption from it, where they you know point to various. There's a speech actually. That's the big news, right? Where you got uh, uh, a speech basically from one of the head regulators saying we're going to grant an exemption to BNY Mellon. The question becomes why? And there's sort of collaboration agreements they've cited with state regulators and other institutional custody risk management controls that are in place. But the long and the short of it is. They're already pivoting away from the requirements of SAB 121, which is extraordinarily unpopular, so much so that it had bipartisan support to repeal. So the question is, where do we go from here? Um, you know, BN, uh, BNY Mellon was able to successfully navigate uh, the SEC, SEC's requirements to get this exemption, which is not really fair. And people are crying, well, wait a second, you're again picking and choosing favorites. You're not giving this to other major players, people like Custodia Bank and others that are trying to, in good faith, comply with the requirements. You're picking and choosing winners. Once again, SEC, which is not your role is supposed to do, you're supposed to be agnostic as opposed to banking and institutions. You're supposed to have a level playing field for consumer protection. You're not doing that. So the question is, in the new administration, whether it's a Harris administration or a Trump administration, will you get a repeal finally of 121? And I, for one, think you do. Um, I think regardless of the administration that takes a hold, I think you do get a repeal um, just because there's bipartisan support for it. And I still am confused as to why the Biden administration felt the need to veto it in the first place, um, considering, you know, even people like Chuck Schumer voted for it, um, for the repeal that is. Uh, so, you know, from my standpoint here, I think this all goes away. I think obviously if former President Trump captures uh, the White House uh, in November, I think that is going to be almost a done deal that 121 goes away. Um, Harris administration is going to be a little bit different. 
uh, probably less likely. But overall, I think there's enough bipartisan support and there's enough of Wall Street money behind it. That's the key. Wall Street money and influence lobby to eventually get it uh, to go away. What do they have to uh, match it with? So I'm assuming they're still listing it as a liability, but how much assets do they have to have, let's say, if they have $100 million worth of Bitcoin on their balance sheet that they're custodying? Well, this is the confusing thing because they haven't been really clear about it. Uh, we only have this speech, right, where they have said that they qualify for the exemption, but we don't know what the specific factors that they're looking at that, uh, you know, they're all soft, right? We, we, it's kind of, we don't know under the hood what specifically led them to that uh, variance, they call it, variance from the, the requirements. So uh, it's, I wish I could give you a more direct answer. I know I have clients that would love to have a more direct answer on it, but <laughs> unfortunately uh, we don't. We, with the SEC, it's always, you know, sort of, um, you know, tell us everything and we'll, we'll, you'll hear from us at some point down the line. Uh, which is it's very frustrating, right? That's not a good way to conduct uh, major policy, specifically in an area as important as, as Bitcoin. So the question really becomes like, so why do you think that it was declined? Is it just to give them a head start over everybody else? Is this, I would imagine it's very political. I mean, what's the, what's the tinfoil hat rationale behind these actions? Because the actions don't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, look, when I need a tinfoil hat answer, I go to American How. That's just generally where I... <laughs> well, the government's not in a government's not inefficient, Joe. How dare you say that? By the way, somebody will knock at your door shortly, and also they love you and want what's best for you. <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, I, you know, I don't really know what to make of it. It seemed like it came out of left field. Were you expecting that this week? I, I was no. not expecting this at all. Yeah, many industry participants were taken off guard by it. I mean, it, it seems uh, strange. Um, I, I do know that there was, uh, some signaling from the fed, the fed had to issue a non-objection letter, uh, to be in line, which is interesting why they would do that. I'm not quite sure. Um, but yeah, I'm sure we will find out in the coming weeks and months. Uh, you know, there, I think some of the most interesting news of the week came, I don't know if you guys saw the threads about Silvergate, right. And some of the yeah. efforts that were filed and declarations on that and how we know now definitively that. Uh, Silvergate was, you know, taken out back and shot because it was pro crypto. So, um, you know, we, we learned these things after the fact, and I'm sure there is a story here that has yet to be reported that we will learn after the fact. Yeah. So for people that aren't tracking back when Silvergate went down, um, there was a lot of debate as to whether it actually, uh, was short on capital and that they went through bankruptcy or they were purposely killed because they were basically the banker to all these, these businesses that are dealing in crypto. And, uh, this past week, there's been a lot of evidence that came out that it was actually the latter is that they were, they were in fact killed by the government on purpose. Um, and that they actually had liquidity to service, uh, all their, you know, all their obligations. So, uh, Nick Carter w had a major role in first reporting on it. And then I, I know this week he was putting out amazing content. Uh, I think Caitlin was also putting out some stuff, uh, with respect to that. What I find so, uh, really frustrating is for, for Caitlin dotted every I crossed every single T for years. I, I think, uh, what was the bank originally called? It wasn't Custodia bank. It was originally, uh, you guys remember the name? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. It's uh, been a uh, while, but like, I mean, start, that was start with the A. Or the A, right? Like four years ago, she was yeah. starting. Oh, Maybe even oh, longer March. than that. Oh, uh, yeah. What was that? Yeah, what was that? I got to look it up. Yeah. Oh, geez. But anyway, so my point is, is that she's been at this for a really long time, trying to get a Fed master account. The irony that she's saying, yeah, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to fully reserve everything. Right. And then bas basically saying, well, we can't have one person like doing things honestly here and everybody else is fractional reserved. So they slow rolled the approval. Then they just flat out declined and said it's not approved. And then they go this week and approve, you know, BNY Mellon to basically provide custodial services. So she was pretty vocal, obviously. Uh, online about a lot of this for good reason. And I can only imagine, uh, you know, the, the case that she has against the fed, but I guess from, from my vantage point, it's like, well, they, in a, in a way, because they slow rolled it and whatever shenanigans were played in the background, you're still going to end up losing regardless of how good your case is, because now they're all in this game and 
you're still not, or you're starting, or even if they gave her approval now, you're starting from like zero and like flat footed and they're all just off to the races. So it's really insanely frustrating to see like that level of corruption playing out. And, and, you know, I'm very comfortable saying that I think you all three would agree. It's just total government corruption, uh, in that particular case. Um, Avanti bank was the one you're talking about. Avanti. Oh, Avanti. Avanti. Avanti bank but that was renamed into uh custodia bank right um here's where i'm going with all this sorry i'm talking so much what i find so fascinating is i did an interview with paulo from tether they're now uh, at 119 billion of assets under uh you know treasuries that they're squatting on and they have tokens that are issued on top of this i can't say i've audited it on the one, but I'd be pretty shocked at this point that for the number of bear markets that they've gone through and how they've continued to hold their peg, that they're not backed. The fact that you're kicking off a 5% coupon on, you know, three month money, and then he's plowing that into Bitcoin, which then is, you know, hasn't had a compound annual growth rate lower than 25% over any four year period, um, tells me that he's, He's probably deeply over collateralized on the assets, the 119 billion of assets under management. And what I find fascinating is effectively he's doing uh, fully reserved banking, right? Like we look at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, how long ago was this now? Two, almost two years ago. Almost two years ago, I think right? Yeah, two years, yeah. And everybody ready to poop their pants, whether they were going to get bailed out by, by the central bankers, or they were going to get their 250K FDIC check, even if they had $10 million on deposit. Um, that's the fractional reserve game. And you look at now some of these stable coin issuers, and it almost, it almost feels like that might be safer because it's fully backed and fully reserved 100% versus these fractional reserve banks that are being kept out of this market because they're not allowed to, to custody. I see Joe's disagreeing, and I want you to no, just... No, I, I actually agree, but I think that uh, I have to be whipping boy to play devil's advocate here for the Fed. Why? Yeah. They, we could talk about that if you wanted, why they yeah. fully reserve back uh, in banking operations. Let's do it. Right? Okay. So let's, let's, again, this is not Joe's view, right? a full disclaimer, so don't at me, but I, I'll just tell you. Okay. So the whole premise behind the entire system, right, is credit creation. Credit creation is the heart of the system. So if you have a fully reserved banking institute, you inhibit credit creation. Yeah. So Fed opposed, the Fed opposes that largely because in their mind, in times of market turmoil, in times of downturn, their influence, their transition mechanism, Preston, to affect monetary policy is muted. They do yeah. not have the ability to play on the levers of monetary system to incentivize. In other words, they would say it's inflexibility. To borrow another term from a recent debate we've had all over uh, Twitter, is they would say you have created an inelastic money supply with a fully reserved banking system, that that yeah. is pernicious to our system, that an in inelastic system says that in times of downturn, we do not have liquidity tools to incentivize and restart the system. The system freezes up like a patient going into cardiac arrest and it dies. So from their perspective, they think that these types of ideas are dangerous. Um, they, they actually undermine their authority and their ability to control the system, right or wrong, that's their thought process. The inflexibility that is associated with full reserve back systems is what is, I think, in their mind, a threat to the stability of the greater uh, monetary policies. I totally agree with what you just said. That's you how they view it. I don't agree. No, 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 no. I'm saying I agree that from their vantage point, that's what, how they see it, right? This is, this is a yeah. threat against them and the, yeah. the way that they implement policy if you would allow fully. Of course, I don't want that. I think that's... You know, it's a, it's a way to mask the printing is what it is because you're just doing it through the credit creation. But, um, curious if you guys, uh, do you guys, this is, this is the question I had. Do you see tether and circle basically doing like an end around, uh, fully reserved banking and they're doing it in a way that, uh, the fed really doesn't understand that that's what they're providing in their, in their service. And. It's interesting because they're really not playing by the rules, but then you have people like Caitlin Long that are out there like knocking on the front door at the Fed and saying, hey, I'm willing to do all the paperwork. I'm willing to do all the stuff. And because she's willing to play by the quote unquote rules and be fully reserved, 
they're basically saying, yeah, uh, you're trying to play a game that that's unfair and you're trying to play it fairly, like get lost. Yeah. There, there was a Willy Wu tweet tweeted recently. He said, um, BlackRock has 19,800 employees and it has 10.4 trillion AUM, which is 10% of the world GDP. And they make 5.5 billion profit. Tether has 50 employees. They have 119 billion AUM, which is 0.1% of world GDP. And they make 6.2 billion in profit. And Tether really makes 700 million dollars more than BlackRock does annually, right? So, like, the, but the thing is that 10.4 trillion AUM for BlackRock—that's the—that's the actual key number because that number says I'm in the club. Not only am I yeah, in the club, yeah. I'm a big part of the club, right? Tether, I think, is too big to fail at this point. I think Tether is going to be. I think they're going to bring Tether into the club. That's what I think is going to happen. But this like sort of shadow banking system with stable coins, I, I don't think they're going to be able to end run around it uh, for that much longer. I, th I think basically like if you're big enough, you're going to be offered a seat at the table uh, or a half seat at the table at least. And if you're smaller, you're going to get clipped. That's that's the way I see it happening. I think this is why the SAB 121 thing is such a big deal is because I think these too big to fail banks are looking at the old legacy fractional reserve banking system and they're saying, Look at, look at these guys over here, this ragtag team of call it a hundred people. They're making more profit than BlackRock in the last 12 months. We want to play that game. We don't want to, you know, have to obey these 121 rules. We want to be able to play in this stable coin market and back. We'll buy all the short duration issuance you want us government. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're just going to issue a coin on top of it and, and, you know, keep the coupon, right? Uh, or at least most of it. And I think that that's kind of the game that they're trying to get into. I think the big banks are trying to get into the game that Tether and Circle and others are playing. And it's, it's fascinating to me because they're wanting to undo the fractional reserve game that they're so well-versed at. And one other thing that I find fascinating about this is think about their revenue for like, if you're a traditional banker, and uh, Max Kai said this to me when I was doing an interview. He said, think about traditional banking and fractional reserve banking. If you take a $10 deposit and you can lend out 100, you're making revenues off of the 100 that you're lending out, the percentage of the interest off of the 100, not the 10 that's on deposit. He's like, so you're collapsing multiples if you start you know, uh, fully reserving everything because you're not going to be able to lend out 10 times as much. And uh, it, it was a really interesting comment. And you can see how they're kind of, if you're a legacy banker, you're at odds with, you want to be still playing this fractional reserve game because you've got multiples of 10 on, on the deposits that you can lend out and the money that you can make off of it. But at the same time, you're looking over here at this guy who's like eating your lunch from a profit standpoint with a hundred employees and he's fully reserved. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's really at odds. He's the, the, the legacy system. And I think where we're all going with stable coins. Um, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts guys? What do you think, Jeff? Well, love it or hate it. Tether is just an astonishingly good business model. And I wish I would have thought of it first. And it's so interesting to think about it. The difference between going out and building a business and then asking and asking for permission versus doing it the Caitlin Long way and doing everything yeah. by the book and asking for permission and just getting stonewalled the entire way yeah. out. I feel so bad for Caitlin because she works so hard and she's trying so hard to do what's right and she just keeps getting stuffed. And yeah. you know, yeah. like it's really frustrating to watch. But this this is also the why I don't invest in lawyers. No offense, Joe. Sorry. Law lawyers are too bound by you know the rules of convention. You know what I mean? You need the entrepreneur who says, I don't give a what's illegal. We're doing it anyway, you know? Okay. Here's where I want to go next. Okay. So when I look at, when I look at Tether, a majority of these tokens are issued on Tron. Okay. Some are issued on Ethereum. Some are issued on uh, Solana, I think. So where I want to go with this is when I look at these other quote unquote, quote, blockchains, and we all, we're all hardcore Bitcoiners here. It seems that the sole purpose of these other blockchains which, that we all know are centralized and uh, from different degrees, right? They're all centralized in, in different ways. Um, and they're very different than Bitcoin. 
uh, with respect to being able to run a full node and like actually governments, if they really want to shut down any of these things, they can go in there and they can lay the screws to these very centralized servers that are running all this massive amounts of data that, that are, you know, these ones that I just named. In addition to that, these stablecoin issuers are highly centralized themselves. I mean, I was doing an interview with Paul. He literally referred to Tether as a coin because he is centralized. He's like, I, if somebody comes knocking at my door, I have to oblige. I have to answer this. I'm controlling a ledger of how many coins are issued against these treasuries that I'm buying that some bank is custodying. So it seems like this whole hodgepodge of quote unquote crypto if I had to say what the point of all of this was, as we were banging our heads and trying to fight this battle for a decade at this point, it's to basically tokenize fiat, right? It's to tokenize the dollar. It's to tokenize the euro. And beyond that, it doesn't really appear to have much of a use case. Now, people are trying to tokenize real equity. There's a company called Stalker that uh, is doing that in Europe, which is really an interesting discussion. There's some other you know, edge cases, but for all intents and purposes, I'm curious if you guys agree with this. It seems like the whole point of all these other blockchains is to tokenize the dollar and to expand the dollar's reach and to make it more saleable and immediately settling all around the world. Would you guys agree with that? I mean, I think that the coins that did well realized that early on, like Tether realized that early on and did really well. And it, at any given time, if you go look at the top 10 digital currencies, like half of them are digital dollars, right? Yeah. And the other half are just trying to put up a narrative front to appear credible enough as a challenger to Bitcoin to soak in enough liquidity so that they can abscond with the funds and then basically slow rug uh, where, you know, you, you sort of sunset the project in public by saying, oh, we're doing ETH2. <laughs> well, what happened to ETH1? It's dead. Um, so yeah, I, I think basically that is what's going on. And I, you know, I think the US government really doesn't have a problem with it. They just have a problem with who the players are. Mm. Uh, they'd like to switch some of the players out, you know, mm. like they want BlackRock to be one of the players. And, you know, speaking of BlackRock, BlackRock is heavily interested in RWAs, real world assets, uh, which, is, you know, it's, it's those are coins. And uh, the, the reason they're probably going to be successful at them, or at least moderately successful with them, is because you can get around the Oracle problem if you're BlackRock, by just being the Oracle, we're the Oracle, we're BlackRock. We'll tell you what's what, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to, you know, do the same sort of, you know, left hand, right hand, you know, sleight of hand that, that goes on in, in cryptocurrency or with algorithmic stable coin or any of that stuff, you know? You can just straight up say, we're the authority and this is what it is, you know? Yeah, I, I view it as all being traced back to the exchange activity, okay? So if you look at the, the idea of cross-border payments, remittances, peer-to-peer -peer transfers, all that, it accounts for less than a fourth of the overall volume for the stable coins. The vast majority of the stable coin volume is on exchange activity, right? So people trading Bitcoin, Ether, other uh, altcoins, um, and they're trading them against uh, the dollar pairs, right? The peg tokens, so they can hedge in and out of volatility. And why are they doing that? They're doing it because a lot of the quote unquote crypto exchanges cannot uh, deal with the regulatory environment. So they are forced to not have banking accounts. So most notably Binance and others, they only deal in stable coins because that makes it harder, not uh, impossible, but harder to shut them down. So the entire stable coin market developed largely as a product for these casinos to fund them and allow trading activity where people could get in and out of uh, these various tokens or assets into something more stable and hedge that volatility. So uh, although there is uh, in the third world uh, emerging markets, rather, uh, there's, you know, obvious uses for cross-border payments and re remittances, it still makes up overall uh, a minority of the overall volume for the stablecoin market. So it all goes back to the exchanges. And I look at it mostly as just how do we create exchanges without having to have bank accounts frozen? And the obvious answer was the stablecoins. You create a buffer where you have these centralized entities tokenize the dollar so that you can get in and out of assets for trading purposes. I think Joe gave a very charitable explanation, uh, too. I, you know, I would say they were straight up for evading taxes. That's what they were for. You know, I mean, sure. talk, talk to the average crypto trader. They have a erroneous belief that if they go from, you know, a uh, Bitcoin to a stable coin to Monero back to a stable coin, that uh, there were no transactions that were traced that were taxable in that chain. It's like, no, dude, they were all taxable. <laughs> Each one of them. Yeah. I know. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's trouble. Um, 
something interesting seems uh, when you're looking at Ethereum. Ethereum has been getting destroyed lately uh, <laughs> in in price terms, right? In in dollar terms against Bitcoin and and others. It was interesting. I remember this back and forth that I had online. This was probably four to six years ago. I, I'm thinking uh, with Adam back, and Adam said to me you know, very, uh, casually, he's like, well, you know, now you have, uh, Solana and now you have Tron and it just seems like they're just a lot better from a, a, a fee settlement standpoint and a speed of settlement standpoint. And they're all centralized. He's like, so you, if you're going to cheat, you might as well just cheat better than the other ones. And it seems that, uh, Ethereum is kind of caught in this, in this situation where they were still trying to be decentralized. I mean, it was proof of work for a very long time. When did they come off? Uh, when did they go to proof of stake? Like 2022 or? One year, yeah, 2022. Or like two years ago, three years ago, um, they moved from proof of work to proof of stake. So they were still trying to keep it together and still trying to be decentralized. But these other ones came along and were like, yeah, well, we're not, we're not actually decentralized. We just, we just say that, right? we're faster, we're cheaper, and we're going to win because that's what people actually want. And they don't really, they really don't care whether we're decentralized or not. And the government doesn't seem to be shutting us down. So we're just going to continue to cheat, right? It's, it's all legacy uh, thinking, right? The best ones that cheat are the ones that win. Um, so I guess it's interesting to me to see Ethereum really losing a lot of market share right now because they just didn't cheat well enough or they weren't, am I framing this correctly or am I kind of out to lunch? What do you guys think? Well, I, I think one thing you were keying on there is that the pro, the, the main difference between Ethereum and Solana is that Ethereum, um, enforces a lot of the cost of running the system on the users and Solana enforces a lot of the cost of running the systems on the developers. And mm -hmm. obviously if you're trying to create, you know, consumer applications, which one of those is, is going to have more buy-in, it's going to be the one that doesn't penalize consumers, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, that's the main reason why this Solana and Tron and whatever are, are doing better than, than Ethereum. And I think Ethereum is, I've thought for a long time that it's like a slow rug and that, you know, Vitalik is looking for a way. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people got rich off of it and like good for them. And, you know, now they can ride it off into the sunset and buy Bitcoin and uh, stop going to their weird conferences where they dance around on stage. And sing. And sing. Yeah. Okay. One of the most common questions I get asked from family and friends is, Preston, where do you personally buy your Bitcoin from? And the answer is really simple. I buy it on river.com. Not only can you easily buy Bitcoin with zero fees on recurring orders, you can have peace of mind knowing Bitcoin on River is held one-to-one -one in multi-sig cold storage, all while being fully licensed and regulated in the United States. Plus, their relationship managers are US-based and available by phone for you or your business. Additionally, River has built their own infrastructure from the ground up, which means they don't rely on third parties to function like other Bitcoin exchanges. River also just created a new feature not found anywhere else called River Link. It allows you to send Bitcoin over a text message to easily orange pill your family, pay a friend for dinner, or send a gift. There's a new standard for investing in Bitcoin, and River is setting it. Go to river.com slash fundamentals and get up to $100 free when you sign up and buy Bitcoin. That's river.com slash fundamentals. Holding Bitcoin is the best way to protect your family from the threat of fiat currency collapse. And few people understand this better than Tony Yazbek, cybersecurity expert and founder of The Bitcoin Way. Tony was in Lebanon when the currency imploded. He's seen the chaos that erupts when the ATM stop working and the bank accounts get frozen. He knows what it's like to lose everything. But with his cybersecurity expertise and by fully adopting Bitcoin, Tony was able to engineer his escape. And now Tony and the Bitcoin Way team work to make sure this never happens to you. With over 25 years of experience, their expert training empowers you to self-custody your family's Bitcoin the right way, secure your devices and protect your privacy, develop robust inheritance plans, and secure for Plan B citizenship. The Bitcoin way can transform you into a sovereign individual. You just need to take the first step. Schedule a free consultation today at thebitcoinway.com slash TIP. Uh, anything else there? Are we good? I think we're good. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it's the spot on. I mean, at the end of the day, right. Most of these chains are for 
minting useless tokens, uh, mean coins, right? And, and trading them between one another. And if you can do that cheaper and you have the backing of VCs, which Solana has a ton of, you know, make no mistake, they have a ton of very important firms backing the operation, right? They're, so they've got the institutional side behind them, plus they've got the cheaper product. Uh, so it seems like a real uh, a recipe to steal market share from ETH. All right, final topic. 50 BIP cut this past week. Mm. We have been tightening. We've been, uh, from a global liquidity M2 standpoint, have been going sideways for, what, two years now, guys. And I just saw that global M2 broke out. And we have the Fed cutting. I just saw tonight that China is uh, aggressively uh, adding liquidity into the market. I'm throwing this over to Jeff. He's been very quiet. This is the topic he loves to talk about. Where are we at? Are we going to continue to chop sideways or are we about to break out into a bull market, Jeff? What's the bull crab market is over. I, I, oh, I wow. It's it's the bull market officially. So we have, for all these reasons we're talking about, liquidity is breaking out. Global M2 is rising. Um, it doesn't really matter what... So it, most people are US centric, but what when you're talking about global assets like Bitcoin, which is the premier global asset, you want to see global M2 monetary supply rising, and that's where you have the strongest correlation. When the Fed dropped by 50 bips, other central banks are dropping as well. That's lowering the cost of capital for people, right? So, so for, for people in the audience who don't know this, right, like the prime rate is, is what most variable shorter-term borrowing rates are based off, and the prime rate is based off the federal funds rate. So when the Fed funds rate drops from 55 to 5 the prime rate dropped from about 8.5% to 8%. And if you have something like a HELOC or credit card debt or you're a small business with small business loans, those kind of things, that means literally the next day your rates dropped by about 50, be 50 basis points. What does that mean? You have more cash in your pocket. Your cash flow is just instantly improved, right? I have a HELOC. My cash flow is just improved a couple of days ago. That's fantastic. And they're going to drop. They're probably going to, I think they're going to do a couple of 25 bit uh, cuts in November and December. So it'll be a full like 100 basis point cut uh, by, by the end of this year. That's that's my take on wow. it. Wow. That's, that's real money. So what that does, that means you have more money in your checking in your savings account or in your money market fund or, or in your CD. That's what glo that's what M2 is, right? It's the cash that's floating around. It's checking savings accounts. It's, it's, it's uh, retail, money market funds, and CDs. And so that just means that supply is rising. That means just regular people all over the world suddenly have more cash. And what what do they do with that? Yeah, yeah, they pay their bills. That's going to be a bit of a relief for them from a cons consumption side. But now they have more money to play with. And that's why you start seeing the risk curve. People start to move out on the risk curve when this starts to happen. And I think what we're starting to see, and if you look at past cycles, obviously, well, Hoddle and I talk about this all the time. It feels just like it did back in 2016. It feels just like it did back in 2020. When you have that kind of everybody's just just chomping it at the bit, they're just getting so impatient. I see people bailing. They're like, I thought Bitcoin was awesome. I thought you said it was going to go up and I bought in at 55 or 60K and it's just still sitting at 60K, 58K forever. I hate this. And they're bailing. And I'm like, please, please don't. Like, this is when you want to be in right now. And so I think that the next 13 months, you know, we're doing this on September 23rd. I think the next 13 to 14 months are just going to be lit and we're going to start slowly at first. And then I think we're going to get that exponential move higher as people start getting confidence. The other thing I think people aren't realizing is there's doom and gloom recessionistas all over the place still. I listen to them every morning. They're, they're good people. They're smart economists and they're wrong. They're just totally wrong. We are not headed into a recession. I think GDP is going to surprise to the upside. I think manufacturing is going to start shooting higher and quickly. And once everybody figures that out and we see that economies are actually starting to grow again, especially here in the U.S., it's just going to be off to the races and it's going to be bananas. So I'm very much looking forward to 2025. Joe, do you agree with that? Um, yeah. I mean, look, I think it's uh, it's very hard for me to listen to the recessionistas with some of the economic data we have. Um, you see uh, several, you know, cyclical sectors which have been lagging, right? But overall, aggregate growth, which is how you measure a recession, has been robust, right? You see unemployment, which is significantly below the 50-year average, uh, hovering right above the 4, you know, 4%, 4.2% actually ticked down last data point we had. Um, you know, you see that now we're in an environment 
where inflation has effectively cratered, right? I mean, you basically have seen inflation come down by the government standards at around 2.5. If you believe the private sector data, like we're well under 2%, we're well under the target. So why shouldn't the Fed cut? I mean, honestly, the Fed, I was surprised they cut 50. Um, I think that perhaps the deflation out of China is perhaps scaring them more than uh, people expect. Mm. Um, but reality is, I mean, you, you look at the inflation data, they've, they're at target minus OER, which is the single laggard that's holding up the basket. And that's going to take time to come down. So what is the reason for not cutting? Um, you know, and I was saying this months ago, like they probably should have cut at the last meeting. I, I think it would have been better for them to cut 25 and 25 again. But I think they wanted to come out knowing that they're going to have to wait until November uh, for the next meeting to do a cut. And they wanted to come out and signal that the, cut, the cutting cycle is here. And what I will note is that if you were following the rates market, if you were following the bond market before the Fed did anything, right, the two-year, the 10-year, most of the curve already told you that cuts were coming. Um, they dropped significantly. Mortgage rates reached a significant low even before the first cut. So the transmission mechanism, by the time the Fed is acting, is really delayed. They're really just following what the market had already done and already signaled with cutting rates, which is responding to the inflation impulse. So to me, I think it's 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 positive. Uh, I still am frustrated beyond belief. I want to pull out my hair when I hear these things about, oh, well, whenever the Fed's cutting, the stock market's about to implode and go down 60%. And I see these ridiculous charts. Uh, I'm sorry for getting worked out, but they're, they're infuriating where you see like I mean, 2008. Sorry, we're at all time. Ahead. We're at all time highs right now, and yeah, uh, I mean, you it, think it's going hot? It's it's gonna it's gonna rip. We're gonna have a melt up from here. I don't I don't necessarily believe in the melt up thesis. I think you could do very well uh, with you know a fifteen percent, twenty percent move. Um, yeah, mostly because some of these guys, the melt up guys, have been calling for a melt up for like you know four years. <laughs> There's guys on Twitter that have uh, have said this, but I mean, look, like w this is an environment where inflation has come down. You've had effectively a Goldilocks scenario where real growth remains above trend. Nominal growth remains significantly high. You've got household net worth at all time record highs. Um, where is the weakness coming from? Explain. Now, obviously, something can happen, right? You can get a catalyst any day. You can get something to you know come out of left field and change the game, and that could be a, a significant uh, headwind for the U.S. economy. But it, it's not. I, I find it very difficult for to look at some of these examples where an, an unemployment goes shooting up and people pull up a chart of 2020 or they pull up a chart of 2008 where you literally had contagion in the banking system. Like the banking system was on the ropes, ready to fall apart. And they're going to say like, oh, well, that's going to happen next month. Next month, we'll tune into this program. And all of a sudden there's going to be 25 million Americans out on the street, you know, eating cat food under a bridge. Like that just seems very unlikely. Hey, Bottle. Uh, well, you know, listen, Preston, Jeff and Joe are much smarter than me, especially about economics. And, you know, they really get in the weeds with these kind of guys and, you know, they argue all the finer points. I have a really simple heuristic, which is I listen to these people and I say, is this guy a loser? And if the answer is yes, then I just, I stop listening. No, I mean, like guys, you go back a little over a month ago and you could go on Twitter and there were people talking about great depression like events from the yen carry trade blow up. I mean, I mean, I, I know Dr. Yeah. Jeff heard some of these people. Like, I can't. I'd love to hear his thoughts. Oh, that was that was a that was a hilarious weekend. Everybody was an expert on the the yen carry trade. Eh? It was, it, it was amazing. Tell us all why we were all going to be doomed, you know? And, and, and then a week later, okay, we're off to all time highs. Like, <laughs> it wasn't okay. even a week later. It was two days later. It was two days later. It was like Monday hit, and I mean, it looked like Armageddon. Tuesday, I think, was bad, and then Wednesday, we were back to where we were at. Like no, the market I mean, bid, whatever percent, it was crazy. So what I would love to hear your take, Preston, what, what message do you think that's sending? I mean, if you, you look at these broad ray of, uh, at markets and you see them sending the message, what do you think there? What do you, what is the signal? I don't know. I think they're going to plug any type of liquidity gap immediately. Like I, I don't, and this was the crazy part with that one. I don't even know what they actually did. I would assume they opened swap lanes, but it wasn't like, uh, swap lines, but I, but uh, I didn't read that anywhere in the Wall Street Journal or anywhere, right? Like, what did they do to plug that, to to stop the unwinding that was happening? I mean, it is aggressive. Those two days were really aggressive. What did they do? I don't know. Do you guys know? I just think some trades unwinded and the market settled at the new the new uh, level, and now we're we're carrying on as usual. Yeah, I mean, there were some public reports about um, some of the BOJ finance ministers saying that they were prepared to hold off on future hikes and 
you know, that's a really interesting subject, right? The fact that uh, there's still potential out there for hikes uh, with Japan, uh, right? Like further BOJ hikes to defend their currency, which if you go back six months or a year, right, all you heard about was when is the yen going to stop selling off against the dollar? Now it's the exact opposite. What is the dollar going to find a bid against the yen, right? And I think there's reasons for driving that, one of which is, you know, the Fed ending, entering a cutting cycle, which was well telegraphed. And then the BOJ saying, we still are concerned somewhat about inflation. We want to continue to hike. So that differential is driving that action and that leverage unwind is not a systemic risk. Uh, in my mind, it's, it's more of a, a, an isolated risk for traders. Like those traders in a mechanical way have to close their positions and sell down, uh, to draw, you know, to draw down their, their, their margin effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, in general, I, I think everybody's bullish for the coming year, like, uh, Christmas of 25, if we are, you know, fourth quarter of 25, if we're recording where you, you think we're talking about not the 58 K gang, we're talking about the 580 K gang. Is that, is that what's, what, what are you guys thinking? I'm sticking to? with my, I, I, this is the, I'm breaking all the cardinal rules. You don't pick a date and a, and a price, but I'm doing both. I'm saying at Halloween of 2025, we'll be at 475 K. Whoa, that's really, Jeff, I'm surprised you're saying this. Okay. I've been saying this for like a year though. This is nothing new. Wow. Okay. 475 uh, Halloween 25. Okay. Joe. I I have no idea. I've had this hat. I don't know if you can see it. Probably blurry. Um, Getting blurred. Yeah. So, so I have had this hat. Let's see. It's got a bit, uh, it's, it's a Bitcoin hundred K hat right here. I have wanted (laughs) to put this on since 2021. I got this as a gift from a client. And, uh, I really hope I can wear it in the next year that, that will make me happy. If I can wear the hundred K Bitcoin hat, that's a, that's a victory. Joe, I'm going to guarantee that you're going to wear the hat in 2025. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take it off once I get it. So that's, so. that's the rule. Uh, Hoddle, do you remember this guy, uh, parabolic trab from oh, the 2017 yeah. Yeah. in his yeah, yeah. Parts were going to hundred K <laughs> back then. Go ahead, Hoddle. What do you think in the coming year? I, well, I, I already, I have promised, uh, a hundred K by this Thanksgiving, or I will eat Ooh. a pumpkin pie and pumpkin pie is disgusting. Okay. It's the grossest food. It's just that dirty oh, gourd. You stop, can grab. Stop. No, it's stop. horrible. Oh, horrible. Oh, All you pumpkin pie people are communists. We need to kick you out of America. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how, this how I feel about started. This is how I feel about sparkling water, but this is a whole nother topic. <laughs> I but, so yeah, I I told somebody if uh, if we don't hit hundred k by Thanksgiving, I will eat a whole pumpkin pie. This, this Thanksgiving? Hold on, this does, Thanksgiving. This doesn't Thanksgiving. Peter have a bet with like Mike Green or something this year to hit hundred k? I yeah, think he, he does. does. Yeah, he's gonna lose he that. Does. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, you maybe you usually. Win. Historically, we do get bullish towards the end of the year. I think we have a bit of an overhang uh, on taxes, uh, which will you know, settle out mid-October because crypto people are to- just total degens and they don't pay their taxes to the last possible minute. And, you know, I know because I'm one of them, right? And so it's like we got that coming up mid-October and then, you know, you always get the Thanksgiving effect where people are telling their families about Bitcoin and people start getting bullish, et cetera. And like, I don't know. Things just tend to ramp up towards the end of the year. I mean, in, that happened in 2020. It happened in 2016. I, I don't see a reason why it wouldn't happen again this time around. And then for, you know, going forward, like Christmas time of, uh, you know, 2025, I'm just as bullish as Jeff. And I, and I do think that uh, there's a possibility that we take out this sort of higher lows thesis. You know, there's always some sacred cow to be killed in Bitcoin in terms of narrative. Last time it was never below the, the prior all-time high. Well, we took mm. that one out. Yeah, we, we went down to 15 and I cried a little bit, but I, I got my big boy pants back on and I was, I'm doing okay now. But, you know, after I got done well, wiping my eyes with Kleenex, uh, I, I was looking forward to the next cycle and I said, what's the next sacred cow that we're going to get rid of? And I, I think maybe it's, you know, higher lows or sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Higher uh, lows. Diminished returns. Diminishing returns. Diminishing returns. returns. Yeah. yeah. You know what, Hoddle? I think you might be right on that one. I, I hope be I surprised. am. I would not be surprised if you're right. And on. so if we do get to a level, let's say, here's how I anticipate it going. We get to this level that's like 180, 200, around there, right? And everybody yeah. goes, right, this is it. We did it. This is the new all-time high. I'm going to sell a bunch. returns, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell a yeah. bunch of my Bitcoin. Look at me. I'm so smart. And then, boom, it catches a crazy bid. It goes up to 500. And then everybody's going, oh, my God, I got to get back. I got to get back in. This is going to a million dollars. It's got to go to 580. It right. Has to get- well, and then once people pile back into the trade, 
that's when you could get a real crazy yeah. portfolio going up because that that's when you could legitimately take a run at a million dollars because, uh, you know, I mean, sitting on the sidelines, like if you got out at 180 and Bitcoin goes to 500, you can't sit on the sidelines, especially uh -oh. if, if you're a long-term hot, uh -oh. no, you're, no uh -oh. way, right? So like, to me, I think if we do take out the diminished returns narrative, we could legitimately take a run at a million dollars. And I, I, you know, it's either going to be one or the other. We're either going to stick low at like 200 or we're going to a million. Well, what, what do you, do any of you think that there's a possibility that we go higher in the six figures next year and then go higher the following year and then go higher the following year? Because that's usually my base. I mean, when I think about it, that's my base case. I, I don't believe, I think that people are screwed up from the collapse in the crypto markets, FTX, uh, institutional collapses in 2022. And they believe that the 80% drawdown is guaranteed. I, I don't expect that this time. I'll put my uh, maybe right not with not not with uh, you know the, the wild card is what happens with the derivatives, what happens with the ETFs, what happens with these really large institutions that are just showing up. And James Lavish says this all the time. He's like, they don't care what the price is. They're just being told, hey, I I need you know this many millions or this this many billions of uh, allocation into this thing. Go get it. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think it's, yeah, it might be a little bit different, Joe. I don't know. I would love to be uh, of the same opinion as you, Joe, but I'm just not. I think three greens, one red is an immutable law of the universe <laughs> or your cycle is real. You know I mean? Yeah. It is I, I think, and, and Joe, to answer your question, if, if global M2, you know, I'm very simple minded. If global M2 is still accelerating higher, then I would say it can keep going up in 2026, but yeah. I think we're just going to follow the cycle again. And it's I gonna roll right. over. I think it's gonna roll over, and then I'm gonna start telling everybody to get cautious, and I'm gonna turn into me and Dr. Barrett again. And well, why do you think Global M2 is gonna? Or sorry, I gotta hear this. What? Why, why do you think Global M2 is gonna decline in 2020? Because it always, it's just everything is cyclical, and so it can't keep going up for it. Just just doesn't go up and uh, up into the right path. It's always it goes up too far, too fast, and then it's gonna roll over, and then. And then all the risk assets are gonna follow, and Bitcoin will lead the way. I, I, that's what I think. So uh, all I uh, it's. It's that I'm until you, doctor. Something. I'm with you, yeah. doctor. I hope not, though. I would love it, Joe. If it, you've talked about this before, and I would love it if it went up to like 75k at the end of this year, and then the end of 2025 was like 120, and then end of 2026 it was like 150. Like that would be fantastic. Well, look, you would be trading it. You'd just be riding it higher. It, everybody points to the equity market as being driven by the liquidity cycle, and you had a you know 20 year bull market in the equity market. Obviously, you have sell offs and drawdowns. But you have a solid bull market that's continued basically since the great financial crisis. Yeah, but M2 um, was so, going up that whole time, Joe. Like, right. So why you know. why would Bitcoin sell off? Well, Bitcoin, I think all I think all Jeff I mean, that, is saying that, is you might get a respite for a year or two. I, that's I, the, I, what I mean. Yeah, I'm a huge believer in the secular bull market continuing. I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, I think we could get a 75 percent drawdown though. I think if we go up to four, we hit my 475k target. I'm going to be telling people I think it's going to go down to 75k in 2026. I mean, Hoddle's saying it's just red, one red dot. He's not saying right. it's two red dots. That's right. It's just one red dot. <laughs> one red dot. Not a big deal. Yeah. It hurts. That was some real dot. analysis here, Joe. It, yeah. Well, it, you know, that's the meme that's going to die. It's going to die this time. We'll see you down. Cycle. Cycle. The, cycle. the confidence. I'll make two promises to you. One is you're going to get to wear your 100K Bitcoin at this in 2025. I hope so. Uh, Hoddle, you're going to be wrong. You're going to lose another bet for being too bullish too soon. You're gonna lose your. You're gonna eat a pumpkin pie, and I want to watch that. You should film oh. that. And then, I just don't I like I, pumpkin pie, but the way he was describing it, it sounded uh, disgusting. disgusting. <laughs> I like pumpkin pie. Blech. Blech. My last thing is, is if we do get four seventy five k in twenty twenty five in the fourth quarter, I am going to be using those um, uh, options, and I'm going to be buying puts at that point. You know how expensive that's going to be? <laughs> that it will be, be expensive. Will be that's, be really it's ripping. that's the, that's what I love about options. If it's ripping higher, buying yeah. puts is going to be dirt cheap at that moment. Cause the, everyone's going to be buying calls. Cause they're going to be listening yeah. to people saying it's but going still, to there's going to be a lot of all that's priced into that. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah. Everybody's going to want the long. Yeah. I'm going to do the dumb thing and just hodl my way through, you know, up to a million down to 75 I'm just going to hodl, you know? Yeah. So that's what I'll be doing. You and me both. That's what I do personally, by the way, I'm two different people when I'm a fund manager and when I'm just myself. Right. Yeah. 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 All right.
Let's wrap right there, guys. I can't thank you enough. This was so much fun. I'm, I'm glad we just uh, let our hair down there at the end and just kind of had a little bit of fun. Uh, Hoddle, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Noster. Check me out on Noster. I, I don't know how to give you the end pub or whatever. Just figure it out. You know, it's complicated. You'll, you'll get there. Just look at how many followers he has. And if he has a bunch, you're probably looking at the right guy. Uh, Jeff Ross, and we'll have a link in the show notes to Primal or wherever you want us to, to, to link to, but I'll have a link in Primal. Jeff. Same for me. I'm old, just and so people know I'm only on Noster now. So if you see me anywhere else on Telegram or LinkedIn or Twitter, it's not me. So it's a scam. Two uh, for two on yeah. Noster only. Noster wow. Only. We'll have your link, uh, your Primal link so people know where you're at on Noster. Joe, are you only on Noster? Uh, I'm not only on Noster. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, also known as X, uh, at Joe Carlosari. If you have a litigated dispute, you can reach out to me. Uh, I am almost at a hundred percent, uh, crypto, uh, cases in the new, new cases being generated, uh, trying wow. to get rid of some of my old ones, but that's awesome. Uh, so I'm any litigated disputes in the broader mining space or crypto space or Bitcoin space. I'd love to help you. Um, and just Google my name. You'll find my website. Uh, but yes, I am on Noster, but I do not post enough. Um, I'm told that I should be more active, which I will make a New Year's Eve resolution to do this year and probably do it. I love it. We'll talk. We'll make sure you do that in the fourth quarter update. So, uh, gents, this was awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really, really look forward to doing these every quarter and you guys are amazing. So, uh, appreciate all of it. Thanks, Preston. It was great. Thanks, Preston. Thanks, guys. It's always a great time to be buying. I put a tweet out saying, what stage of the Bitcoin cycle are we in? And I showed astronauts boarding a rocket. This is your chance to get on before the rocket takes off because the rocket, I believe, is going to take off again. And I might be wrong, but I will be very surprised if one year from today, we're not well above $100,000 per Bitcoin. And I think we'll be moving much higher at that point.